In this video, we're going to have a look at how the structure of a protein is related to its function and therefore how changes in the structure can uh, change the function of the protein or um, inhibit the protein from carrying out its function. So when we're looking at this, there's going to be two features of our chain that we're focusing on. Firstly, we're going to be looking at the peptide links so they are the amide bonds that join one amino acid section to the next amino acid section and also the side groups. So the side groups are determined by the R chain on the individual amino acids. So just to refresh your memory about, so this peptide link here is our amide, amide group. So we've got that repeating along the chain. And we see within the amide group there, we've got a carbonyl, which is capable of hydrogen bonding by being hydrogen bonded to. So I'll just clarify that the for hydrogen bonding to occur, you need a hydrogen directly bonded to a nitrogen, oxygen or fluorine. So we can see this component of the group is capable of forming hydrogen bonds and they form when that partially positive charge, that strong partial positive charge, is attracted to the oxygen or nitrogen in a neighboring chain. So we can see, or a neighboring molecule. So we can see this component of the amide group would be able to be hydrogen bonded to by a hydrogen um, in a different group. So we can see um, when this is near another amide group here, we can see that we can get a hydrogen bonding occurring from this hydrogen to that oxygen and that hydrogen to that oxygen. And we have these amide or peptide links all the way along a protein chain. Now there's a few things that this ability hydrogen bond can do. Firstly, we can get the hydrogen bonding like this um, either within or between chains. So when we say between chains, we've got one protein chain here, another protein chain here, the neighboring amide groups within those chains are able to form hydrogen bonds, which are going to hold those chains closer together. Now the other option is that we might have hydrogen bonding within a chain. So we can see here we've got our protein chain and it's sort of twisted around and we could have hydrogen bonds between those peptide links there. So we can see that that will sort of hold the chain in that shape and that's quite significant and we will revisit that concept when we have a look at the relationship between the structure and a function of, an amide, uh, of a protein chain in a moment. So having a look at a section of a protein chain here, we're reminded that those amide links just keep repeating throughout the chain as they're the joining links between our individual amino acid units. And then there are multiple um, peptide links within a chain. And at each of these sites, um, hydrogen bonding can occur. So we've had a look at how hydrogen bonding can occur between chains or within chains, so with other amide links in other parts of protein chains, but that hydrogen bonding can also occur with water. So we can see hydrogen bonding joining at multiple sites along the chain large structure so they're not going to be soluble in water however um, we know that the number of groups that are capable of hydrogen bonding increases a substance's solubility so in this case what the protein structure is able to do is it's essentially able to hold on to those water molecules so what we see rather than the protein being soluble or dissolving in water 
it's going to hydrogen bond and hold on to those water molecules. So we see proteins absorbing water. And so if you think of some proteins that you might be familiar with, for example, meat, if you think of fresh meat, it's quite moist. And that's because the protein um, making up the meat, so meat is mainly protein, um, is absorbing moisture or it's holding on to the moisture, which makes the fresh meat moist. Also common uh, proteins that you might be familiar with, such as um, wool or silk, um, you'll notice that they can absorb water. And that's the same thing. The sites for hydrogen bonding within the structure allow it to absorb the water. Okay, so it's important just to take note that proteins will absorb water but because they're large molecules, they're not really going to dissolve in water. So with proteins, their structure or their shape, the way they're put together, um, is very important for their function. So that if you change the shape of a protein, you can actually, or you do, you actually change what it can do, which can result in it not being able to perform its function. So structural changes often result in an, a protein not being able to perform its function. And when that happens, we say that the protein has been denatured. So essentially what we're talking about here is we might have our protein structure. Right, it's got a specific shape held together in particular ways. If we change that, and so we disrupt whatever is holding the shape together, our protein will essentially unravel. And now because it's a very different shape, it's not necessarily going to be able to do the same thing it did before. So we look at four levels of the structure within a protein. The first level is the primary structure. And the primary structure is how the individual amino acids within a protein chain are sequenced. Um, and keeping in mind that each of these amino acids are held together by our peptide links, but the actual sequencing, the order of different amino acid units is the primary structure of a protein. So the secondary structure of a protein is how the protein chains fold or twist. So we can see here we've got a protein chain. We've got our sequenced amino acids along here. So that's shown by the colors. I haven't gone all the way along. So we've got our primary structure, but then that either can form twists or folds in that chain. And we're going to have some, some sort of interactions or bonding within the chain there that holds the shape of the chain. So the secondary structure is the folds or twists within the chain. And those folds and twists are generally held in place with hydrogen bonds. Now, the tertiary structure of a protein is how our protein chain, which we've already looked at the primary structure and the secondary structure. So we've got our sequence of amino acids and then our chain in its folded or twisted state. It's how it folds back onto itself. So the tertiary structure is the folding of that chain. Now we can see here that is going to be held in shape, um, usually by the interactions between the side groups uh, of the protein chains. So what I've drawn here is a section of a protein chain where we can see, I've used the different colors to represent the different amino acid components within the protein chain. And then I've just got some examples of different types of side groups coming off of each amino acid. 
So if we have a look in this first case here, what we're looking at is an ionic side group. So a protonated amine or a carboxylate ion there. When that occurs, what we can actually end up with is an ionic bond. So what this is essentially looking at is these sorts of interactions here, which give the protein its tertiary structure. So it's the interactions that go on between these side groups. So if we've got ionic side groups, that interaction holding the structure in place there could be an ionic bond. Now, this next example here is where I've got some polar um, functional groups or within the side chain, and these ones are capable of hydrogen bonding. So we could see we could have a hydrogen bond form here and here. So these are polar side groups capable of hydrogen bonding and in this first example we had ionic side groups. If the side chains only have non-polar components the secondary interactions that will go on between will simply be dispersion forces. And lastly we may actually have situations where we've got covalent bonds um, linking those two sections together. Now if we disrupt these interactions which are holding the tertiary structure in place, the protein is going to unravel or lose its shape um, and therefore denature, it's not going to be able to perform its function. So there's, there's two key ways that you need to be able to explain how this happens. Um, the first is how pH can affect proteins, so how changes in pH um, can disrupt some of these interactions, and also the effect of temperature um, on the protein structure as well, so how temperature can affect some of these. So we'll have a look at the pH changes first of all. So changes in pH are going to affect the bonds formed by the ionic side groups. So changes in pH can be either an increase in pH, so more alkaline conditions, or a lower pH, meaning more acidic conditions. If we have an acidic environment, so low pH, the carboxylate ions will be converted into carboxyl groups. And if we have an alkaline environment, so we're going to have hydroxide ions there, our protonated amine is going to be converted back into ammonia, oh, sorry, um, an amine group. So what this means is in each of those cases, it has lost its ionic component, the charge, which allows it to ionic bond. So if this conversion occurs, this ionic bond can no longer occur. Now temperature can affect the secondary interactions that go on. So that is either our hydrogen bonding, our dipole-dipole interactions, or our dispersion forces. So if the temperature is above about 50 or 60 degrees, that's going to have enough energy to break the secondary interactions that are occurring between the side groups, whether that's dispersion forces, dipole-dipole interactions, hydrogen bonding. So at this point, I just want you to think back to the formation of ethanol via fermentation. And there were some specific conditions that were involved there to do with pH and temperature relating to the enzyme. And so this is a, a good point to recognize that enzymes are proteins and some of these conditions relate back to their structure and the possibility of the enzyme structure being denatured um, in certain environments. So that's why they're sensitive to the pH and the temperature.